Uh, if someone who, I don't know who has the index cards in the crew, but if you have those and people want to, uh, if you want to raise your hand up if you'd like a card to jot down, uh, Ellie Lane will be coming around to do that. I want to move to a couple other uh, meaty issues here. Uh, one of them in particular is the kind of tension between the personal Shabbat, which a lot of your book is about, what it means to experience Shabbat as an individual, and the social Shabbat, the Shabbat of, uh, of the community, the broader community. Um, I think one of the things that is, that is difficult here is, I'm not sure how easily, well this is the question I want to pose. The book in a way is a kind of a pitch for, take Shabbat into your life, it will enrich it, it will make it better, um, and you will be, you'll, you'll be the better off. Um, the challenge is whether the voluntaristic Shabbat is enough. Uh, when Dvarim talks about Shabbat, it says very clearly that its motivation for it is not primarily spiritual uplift, but the Zahar Takiyevadagita Be'eretz Mitzrayim. Remember you were slaves in the land of Egypt, and on some level, the reason I am having Shabbat and enforcing it on you is because I don't want anyone to be enslaved. And the only way that that can really play out is by the society getting back then. I want to take you back to something, words that are, if we can get uh, someone just to cue up here, the, the audio here. Um, blue laws. Um, and just, I'll give you the signal in a second. Um, a case that you litigated, argued before the Supreme Court, back in 1984, um, when you were Attorney General of the State of Connecticut. It was the State of Thornton v. Caldor. You write about it briefly in the book. You'll correct me if I'm wrong, but there had been blue laws in Connecticut uh, for many years, and like in many states, they were being repealed. And one of the things that the legislature wanted to do in repealing those laws was still to enshrine a protection for individual workers that they didn't have to work on their Sabbath. So now that Caldor, the department store, uh, was going to be open on Sunday, no one should lose their job as a continuing employee because they wanted to continue to observe the Sabbath on Sunday, even if the corporation no longer was. And the Connecticut State Supreme Court actually struck down this law as violating the Establishment Clause of the Constitution. And it came before the United States, what, before the United States Supreme Court, was this a violation of the separation of church and state? So I want you just to hear a brief clip of words that are familiar, though I bet you haven't heard them in the last 27 years. Go ahead. If the decision of the Connecticut Supreme Court is allowed to stand, the purposes of the Establishment Clause are literally in my opinion, turned on their head. For that clause was surely aimed at protecting religious diversity and promoting religious freedom is used here as an instrument for invalidating a law which our legislature adopted with the best of motivations and in the finest tradition, permissible tradition, of accommodating the values embodied in the religion clauses of the First Amendment. If this uh, decision is allowed to stand, it really does speak to the ability of the state to act with hostility and callous indifference toward religious freedom that this court has repeatedly warned against. And for those reasons, we respectfully ask you to reverse. Very well, Mr. Attorney General. <laughs> that was Chief Justice Parker. Um, it's a great, great clip from the past. What I, what I want to sort of leverage that for the question is, I think part of what you were arguing there, to give it a little more full-throated religious language, was on some level, the state and some degree of coercion is actually required to protect the religious freedom of the observance of the Sabbath, of Shabbat. Um, I feel, you know, this was, if I remember being horrified this year, hearing that stores were opening Black Friday at midnight, some of them I think even 10 p.m. on Thanksgiving Day. Um, and the sense in which the relentless engine of capitalism, you know, it just it finds its way wherever it is let in. How do we balance that? On the one hand, being a country that's committed to religious freedom, and yet if we're committed to the Sabbath and we actually want people to get something out of Shabbat, can we actually have the state not be able? Uh, first, I want, I want to say that somewhere in heaven, Tim Russert is smiling. <laughs> he pulled an old clip out of me, and uh, it was fun to hear it. Uh, he used to do that on Meet the Press. Um, so, uh, in that case, uh, what was at stake 
was that the law was attempting, even though the blue laws had been repealed, as you said, was attempting to put pressure on employers to accommodate their religious practices. And the employer, Calvor, um, basically said to Mr. Thornton, who was a religious Presbyterian, as I recall, and observed the Sabbath, that they would accommodate by allowing him to work on another day, but in somewhere in upstate New York, which wasn't exactly uh, effective accommodation because you would have to drive up there. Um, so, so to me, that case was about protecting religious freedom, a little bit different from establishing um, the blue laws, with which which ordained that look, which ordained that certain uh, commercial activity doesn't happen on Sunday. This is such a complicated question because the blue laws obviously accepted the societal um, consensus about the Sabbath, or the majority opinion, which was that it was on Sunday, which is obviously the Christian <coughs> Sabbath. Um, although there usually were accommodations in all those laws so that um, people who observed another day as the Sabbath could keep their stores open on Sunday. It wasn't always the case, but in a lot of states that was the case. Uh, over the years, I've met people who were children of Jewish merchants who said if it wasn't for that exception in the Blue Laws, they probably never could have afforded to go to college and graduate school because their parents did uh, pretty well uh, as a result of that. So, you know, when I say we're not going to go back to the Blue Laws, I'm, I really mean in terms of where the society has gone. Although, I, I will tell you that um, if I could, I would. And even though it's it's Sunday is obviously the Christian Sabbath, so you might say that's ordaining a uh, that's that's establishing religion. I, I think you could argue that um, it's achieving a societal value. That I think we've lost something. When I was growing up in a neighborhood in Stanford, most of my friends were not Jewish. A lot of them were, but there were a lot of Catholics, particularly, but even some of the Protestants. But. Um, they, they, my friends were expected to go to church on Sunday, and if they somehow wiggled their way out of that responsibility, they were expected to be home for the family meal. This is the familial communal, communal part of, um, of Sabbath observance. And um, they were able to do that, or most of the parents were, because most of the stores were closed. So they were, were required to work, uh, and um, they weren't tempted to shop. And, you know, I think we have lost something, which is why in the book I'm, I'm appealing to people, whatever their religion, to try to put some Sabbath back into their lives, even if they uh, just, you know, not just, but go, go to a house of worship, or if you don't do that, have a, have a family meal that day, which everybody's around the table, and hopefully you're talking about something other than uh, what, what might be called Marish cut. Uh, nonsense. Um, or put away your cell phone and black requires a thing. It's interesting, you know, one of the things I think actually thinking about this angle in the book made me kind of realize and consider for the first time, one of the things that I think is most jarring to contemporary Jews about the way the Torah talks about Shabbat is that it is a death penalty offense punished by stoning. Right. This is very jarring to people. How can that be? Right? Other things, murder, and even certain uh, kind of adulterous and, uh, and sexual offenses, people can kind of understand as being violent crimes in a certain kind of way with a victim that maybe warrants some kind of response. But Shabbat observance, and why would that have the death penalty? And in thinking about this and thinking back on your case and the question of the blue law, kind of to me, that's only to view it from the perspective of the individual and the religious transgression that they committed. But if you think about it as a kind of harsh response to hey, we're trying to create a certain kind of society here, and you just messed it up for everybody else. Right. That doesn't mean we're any more comfortable with execution in a contemporary context, but it puts it in a completely different, uh, in a completely different setting, which is to say, I mean, Shabbat has a lot riding on it, right? There's this, there's this personal aspect, and there's this aspect of not being made mad and enslaved by all our devices, but there's also this kind of social utopian vision of, if I prevent people from going to these places of work and employ, et cetera, maybe I will create a gap that can be fulfilled uh, in, you know, in some other way. 
Yeah, I agree. And so in the book, I briefly just, you know, call for a volunteeristic response to this. So I, I give a shout out to some businesses that close on Sundays because their uh, owners are religious. You know, a couple of big national chicks. Chick-fil-A, which you don't see too much here, and uh, uh, you know that one, of course. I know you're all dying to go out and buy a Chick-fil-A <laughs> Sunday, but no. Uh, and uh, uh, Hobby Lobby is another one. And of course, in New York, there are some pretty big businesses that close on Saturday because they're owned by Sabbath Observer uh, News. I, you know, I just, somebody sent me an article, I've been traveling the last two weeks, that Roger Cohen wrote from Germany about Volkswagen has just started a program in its German plants, and it's just started with a top level of, of people who, who the company uh, provides with blackberries, and they um, they've restricted they, they from a set from their central station. They, I gather if I got this right, they they block the blackberries after a certain hour of every day. So. When the people go home, the company has decided, interestingly and counterintuitively, that it's in Volkswagen's interest to have these people, I don't know what, going to a movie, reading, spending time with their family, rather than buzzing away on the Blackberry. Either that or they found that at night they were, you know, wasting time on the Blackberry. <laughs> <laughs> things unrelated to Volkswagen. <laughs> Great. I want to get to a couple of the questions that have uh, come in here. We can't get to them all, and I thank you for submitting them. I see, actually, even in the time since they came in, some of them have already been somewhat addressed. Uh, but one coming from a college student who is uh, here uh, learning with us this week. Uh, as an observant college student beginning the career search, I have many peers who have chosen to remove their kipot for job interviews. What would you tell them? Yeah, now, I tell them to be better than I am. <laughs> In other words, I'll tell you this story. Once I was going to a meeting, and I happened to be walking with Harry Reid, now the majority leader. He wasn't the majority leader, but we were friends. And he said to me, you know, Joe, I've been meeting, he's Mormon. He said to me, I've been meaning to ask you something. I know you're Orthodox. Why don't you wear a skull cap? Uh, so I said, you know, that's a really guilt-inducing question. <laughs> 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 this is something that runs through the on <laughs> But uh, I said, because in my generation, growing up as I did in Stanford, Connecticut, uh, where there was, you know, I never experienced anti-Semitism as a kid. We were a minority. But also, I, I, I didn't just I feel like I, I'd be comfortable wearing a kippah. And as uh, uh, Ethan, uh, Ethan and uh, Becca's uh, younger sister, Hani, who's gone somewhat to the right of the family, will say to Hadass and me, when she's angry at us about some religious, she'll say the ultimate concluding argument is, you two are classic 50s Orthodox Jews. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, you know, you were, uh, you're not really, you, were, you really weren't serious. So, uh, <laughs> listen to my orbit. But I'd say now, on Capitol Hill, that there are a lot of people wearing kippot. No, no a member of, of the House or Senate, but it, I don't think it's a problem anymore. And so I'd say if you otherwise would wear a kippah, then wear it. And I'll bet you it's not going to affect uh, whether you're hired or not. 